Good morning, students. In this lecture, we will talk about deflection and the formation of the umbilical cord. At the end of the lecture, I will show you beautiful drawings. These were made by a person called Max Bröder, who was born in Germany, but lived in the United States and made beautiful medical illustrations. And for him, a department even was established. The name of that was Department of Art as Applied to Medicine. So we will see these nice drawings at the end of the lecture. But we will get from this state, when it's practically a flat trilaminar germ disc, to the real shape of the baby. Uh, a few lectures ago, I showed you this model that if, we, if you imagine the trilaminar germ disc as a flat structure with on one side the ectoderm, on the other side the endoderm, in between the layers there would be the mesoderm. Now I represented it just with one sheet of paper. And so this is the trilaminar germ disc. Here would be the head end where you have this white territory. This is here the tail end. And from this a tube will form during the development. Right? And then this tube is lined by the uh, inside, by the endoderm. On the surface, is it, covered by, it is covered by the ectoderm. It has a head end and a tail end, and this would be the dorsal surface, and this would be the ventral surface. We discussed uh, with the definition of the body axis that from this on, it would be so simple to say that, OK, then this is here the right side, and this is the left side. But we learned that it's not that simple. We need certain factors in order to define that special asymmetry of the internal organs. Uh, I also told you at that time that basically this model is true. So that thing that we say that our body is a tube and inside it is lined by endoderm and on the external surface it is covered by ectoderm, ectoderm and in, the mid, in between we have the mesoderm. Basically this is true. Just the tube doesn't form like this. So it's not a simple process like folding a piece of paper. Now we will discuss this process that how this body tube uh, forms. And I used to show this picture in the class and I asked you that what do you see here? And you hesitate what to answer because it seems to be so simple. Really, it is so simple. So this is a somersault. Every three year old knows how to make a somersault. But imagine now that you would have to describe with your present knowledge that which muscles do contract in which sequence and which joints are moved uh, in which directions in what sequence. And you could write 10 pages about a somersault and you still wouldn't understand that this is about the somersault. So about this is the, uh, the uh, case with the with deflection uh, that if you read it in the book, it seems to be quite complicated, though it's quite a simple process. So now I will uh, try to explain it as simply as possible for you. First, let's take a longitudinal cut of the trilaminar germ disc. This is the initial state when it's yet all flat. This territory is here the ectoderm in where it is white. There is the neural ectoderm. The slowest layer, that's the endoderm. The blue one is the axial mesoderm, which is the notochord. The black line is here, the rest of the ectoderm, which at this uh, border, it goes over to the amnion. Here, the endoderm goes over to the yolk sac. And anteriorly from the buccopharyngeal membrane in this territory, from the mesoderm, there is the heart primordium. In the back, there is the cloaca membrane. I put this vertical line onto the buccopharyngeal plate and onto the uh, cloaca membrane. And now we will follow that what happens if this trilaminar germ disc, which is originally a flat structure, starts to grow asymmetrically. Why does it grow asymmetrically? Because the neural tube will develop very quickly on the third week and it will start to close on the fourth week. Right? So this grows very fast because of this. This whole structure will bend. You see that the heart primordium starts to move downward. Right? It's even more and even more. And at the end, this is the end, end position of deflection. We, the endoderm is involved into the body of the baby. We have a deadly ending. Uh, anterior gut, foregut. This, this is closed here by the buccopharyngeal membrane. We have the hindgut, closed by the cloaca membrane. 
and we have a territory that we call Midgard that is connected to the York sack with a wide connection at this stage. The blue line shows you the notochord and the gray territory shows the neural tube which is about to close. Now let's follow these uh, stages also along uh, a, a picture where we have all these drawings. Again the vertical line always goes through here through the buccopharyngeal or oropharyngeal membrane. This line goes through the cloacal membrane right? and the ectoderm bulges out from this layer, bulges even more and more out. With this the cardiogenic zone will move to the ventral side. As we have these uh, dead end tubules uh, anteriorly and posteriorly, uh, we have also kind of borders between them. Uh, these borders of course are not sharply marked lines on the inner lining of the endodermal tube, but you will see in the second semester that the blood supply will keep strictly these borders. So for each segment we will have separate uh, blood vessels. And also this transition between the ectoderm and the amnion, which is originally around this oval shape everywhere. So it would be around, all around this oval shape originally between the ectoderm and the amnion. Uh, that will get to the ventral side of the body and it will be, this oval shape is kept, but it's relatively smaller. I have to stress the word relatively because the absolute diameter of this distance will grow versus this stage, just the rest of the body grew much faster. Right? So this will be, this territory will be the further belly button. In transverse section, first we have the bilaminar germ disc and if we make our cuts through the midgut, right, then we see with the parallel with the flexion as the endoderm of the midgut is involved in the body and we see the connection to the York sac. We wouldn't see this connection if we would make our cuts anteriorly or posteriorly uh, to the midgut. Now these were the pictures that you already saw previously. So we have the trilaminar germ disc, then the neural plate starts to thicken and elevates. Underneath we have the notochord here, the mesoderm is differentiating. With the endoderm nothing has happened yet. And then at the end the neural tube closes and with the lateral flexion the endoderm will be involved into the body of the baby. Again I, I have to note it that you get this picture only if your plane of the cut goes uh, through the midgut. The books, especially the English books, they distinguish the longitudinal folding and the lateral folding. It's true that these fold these two, two parts of the folding which are running parallelly they are uh, regulated by different factors, but actually it's one process. So as you do the longitudinal folding, you will get also the uh, lateral folding. I would like you to show you now this with a hand shoe model. So if you look at this hand shoe, you see this oval circle. That will, would be the edge of the trilaminar germ disc. And this line is the line where it goes over to the amnion. And on the lower layer, it go, the endoderm goes over to the yolk sac. You have two spots on this trilaminar germ disc, these two black spots, this one here, right? That's the uh, buccopharyngeal membrane, this one the, in the back, that's the cloaca membrane. And between the buccopharyngeal membrane and the edge of the trilaminar germ disc, there you have this red spot, which marks you uh, the heart primordium. So originally this is a flat structure, but as the neural tube, which is in between the buccopharyngeal plate and the cloaca membrane, starts to grow much, uh, much faster, uh, starts to go much faster, then the uh, foregut will bulge out like this and the hindgut also, right, it bulges out. You see that this is the longitudinal flexion if you look at this, but if you, if I could show this to you from a closer aspect, then you would see that this has also a lateral folding. And as this longitudinal folding happened, then you see here anteriorly that the heart is already on the ventral side. My two thumbs are in the foregut and in the hindgut and they, and this is a dead end tube closed by the appropriate membranes. Try to make a hand shoe model like this for you and observe that what happens if you push your fingers in like you did. 
Also parallelly with this process, this oval ring, which is originally at the edge of this flat trilaminar germ disk, if I'm pushing my fingers out, then it got to the ventral side of the body. The body grows faster and faster, but this ring will remain there, and finally it will form the umbilical ring. So what's the result of deflection at the end? Uh, that the endodermal body tube is established, so the body tube, which is lined with endoderm on the inside, the intraembryonic, meso uh, intraembryonic body cavity, this body cavity will be closed, and the umbilical cord forms. Now let's see what happens with the surrounding structures. In these pictures, you see longitudinal cuts and transverse cuts here, right? And the gray territories are, are the embryo that I showed you previously, what happened in the embryo, but now we will examine what happens in the surrounding on the third, fourth week, and somewhat later. First of all, you see that the connecting stoke mesoderm, which is orang originally close to the posterior part of the trilaminar germ disk, that migrates ventrally, and at the end, it will be on the ventral surface, and this is uh, embedded into this uh, fused layer of the uh, extraembryonic mesoderm visceral and parietal layer. So all these layers, these will fuse in the future umbilical cord territory and form the Wharton's jelly. Then the extraembryonic salome, that will close, right? Initially we have an extraembryonic salome which widely communicates with the intraembryonic salome al along the entire oval line of the trilaminar germ disk but it's, it tends to disappear. So the central mesoderm and the peripheral mesoderm will fuse with each other and will form the chorionic mesoderm. Also the amnion, with the flexion, it will kind of pull down, right? And it will cover the yolk sac, right? And also a structure here, which I will show later also with a big arrow, this one, uh, the allantois will be involved into this territory Right? These are also structures within the umbilical cord. And now we will get to that point uh, that we explain what really this allantois is. Uh, in the second lecture, I told you this cell sentence, that germ cells migrate to the gonadal ridges on the sixth week from the wall of the York sac along the allantois through the dorsal mesentery. And I told you that I'm sure that you don't understand exactly this sentence, but it needs time that you understand it. First of all, about the germ cells. Now you know already that from the epiblast, the three major germ layers differentiated, plus the germ cells migrated out. The germ cells do not belong to any of the big major three germ layers. Uh, so they migrated out and hide in the wall of the York sac in this territory where this green ring is. And then, uh, why, why did I have to do this? Because on the third week and on the fourth week, when the gastrulation happens, we do not have the gonad anlage to which the germ cells could move in and differentiate further. So they have to go out in order to let the body of the baby uh, develop. Then by the sixth week, from the intermediate mesoderm, the gonad anlage will differentiate, and then they can migrate back along the allantois through the dorsal uh, mesentery about to this region, of course on the sixth week, uh, where we have the, uh, the gonad territories in which they can do their further uh, development. Uh, and what is this allantois? The allantois is a structure, it's an evolutionary remnant, and it, it was needed in, in creatures which developed in eggs, like birds and reptiles, for example, they develop in eggs and they need an allantois. Why do they need it? Because uh, with the mammalian development, uh, a baby uh, gets the nutrients and the oxygen from the placenta, and the metabolites are also eliminated through the placenta. Birds inside an egg cannot have a placenta, but they have to solve somehow that how they have the gas exchange. So they developed a bladder, this allantoic bladder, right? It's a, a vesicle which is, has a thin layer and it, it will be close to the in, inner surface of the egg and through the pores of the egg, uh, the gas exchange may happen. That's one thing, right? What about the nutrition inside the egg? Uh, the nutrition in mammalian that comes from the placenta, right? But in birds, they will pick it up 
from the egg yolk, really. So from what you make, the scrambled eggs, that is everything f a food for the developing bird, right? And that will be carried into the body of the bird through these uh, blood vessels. The body of the bird, developing bird, will work, and it will also excrete a strough. In the mammalian development, the kidneys also develop, but somewhat later. And it's possible to survive the intrauterine period without kidneys. Of course, this will be immediately a big problem after, after being born. But in the uterus, a mammalian fetus can survive without a kidney. Why? Because the placenta does the dialysis. What is with birds? They don't have placenta. So they have to solve somehow uh, this uh, uh, excretional uh, procedure and they develop their kidneys much earlier, functional kidneys much earlier. And the, the kidneys, they work. Uh, and you know that birds have cloaca. And this allantois is a process from the cloaca, which is the common place for the final uh, feces and also from the urine. That's the cloaca. And the process of it is, it is the allantois. Right? And they pee into the allantois, actually, where the pee dries out and it's stored in crystals uh, until the bird is hatched. So that's the allantois, and of course we will not ask you the allantois in the exam, but it's good if you know that what, what it is about when we tell, tell this word allantois. We have just rudimentary remnants of the allantois in the in mammalians and also in humans. You will learn it in the second semester. It's the urachus, uh, a connective tissue strand, which goes from the bladder to the umbilicus. Okay, so what, and then the, uh, the allantois is good for gas exchange, and the urine gets here from the cloaca and dries out in crystals. Okay, but now let's follow that how does the umbilical ring develop. We already mentioned this, but let's summarize it now. So here you see the first, let's think that this is the bioluminal germ disk with the epiblast and with the hyperblast. Then the proliferation starts here. Then the primitive streak is formed, the gastrulation. Uh, starts and we end up with the trilaminar germ disc, ectoderm, in between the mesoderm, that's not shown here, and the endoderm. And the ectoderm around this oval line, it will go over to the wall of the amnion. Right? The, the ectodermal derivatives are quite different from the amnion, so we will see that also histologically, how it looks like on a later uh, figure. Right? So this, uh, this would be this oval ring, and on the ring, you have here the oropharyngeal membrane and the cloaca membrane. In between, there is the uh, neural plate. The neural plate grows, and that makes the ectoderm bulge more and more out from, from this plane. Right? And at the end, you have the huge neural tube of the embryo, plus you will have, uh, as a kind of like side effect, you will have also the endodermal tube, first only enter, uh, uh, foregut and hindgut in a tube shape and the midgut is yet connected with the yolk sac. And this is how it looks at birth, right? That the baby is born. On the surface, there is the skin of the baby. And we know that the skin of the baby, uh, that is stratified squamous keratinizing epithelium, and it comes from the ectoderm. And here you see a sharp line where it goes over to the umbilical cord. And the surface of the umbilical cord is covered by the amniotic epithelium which is a simple cuboidal epithelium, doesn't prevent evaporation. So this, uh, the umbilical cord, when it's cut, it can dry out and fall off and detach from the body of the baby. This figure, in that aspect that it's oval and there are some kinds of uh, markings on it, it's similar to the epibus fate map, but it's not the same. It is, shows you that from the ectoderm, to which regions these ectodermal territories will turn, move uh, later. Uh, so here you have the uh, bucopharyngeal membrane, here you have uh, the anal membrane, the cloaca membrane, and from this territory of the ectoderm, you will get your anterior trunk surface up to the, uh, down to the level of the umbilicus. From this region, you get also the anterior body wall surface, but from the anus to the umbilicus from the lower side. So this half ring, this will be the upper part of the umbilicus, and this half ring will be the lower part, which is covered here, of the umbilicus. And this entire oval thing appears in the bilaminar, then on the trilaminar germ disc, uh, uh, 
at the level of the transition between the ectoderm and the amnion. So don't forget this, please, that this is the amnio-ectodermal uh, junction, and this is the future umbilical ring territory. Now, these pictures are a little bit more sophisticated pictures, which show you uh, cross-sections through the midgut. Right? This is an earlier, this is a later stage. So here you see the, the midgut forming and the connection, the vital line duct, to the York sac. Here, the York sac is already relatively, and the word relatively is uh, important, relatively smaller, and the connection is a long tube, uh, the vital line duct, which connects to the midgut. There you have the intraembryonic salome, here is the extraembryonic salome, and they are yet here connected with each other. Right? We have intra and extraembryonic salome. And also the connective tissue layers, we have uh, intraembryonic somatopleura and extraembryonic somatopleura, and we have intraembryonic splanchnopleura and extraembryonic splanchnopleura. These layers will fuse with each other, so this extraembryonic salome will disappear later, they fuse with each other, and they will form here the connective tissue of the umbilical cord, which we call the Wharton's jelly. Right? Okay. If we make the cross-section just above the umbilicus, between the heart and the umbilical territory, then we get this foregut territory. Right? If we make it distally from the, from the midgut in the hindgut territory, then we have the cross-section of the hindgut. And here you see also that territories of the intermediate mesoderm, which will form the gonadan lager. So, so this will be the territory to which the uh, germ cell uh, cells will migrate back on the sixth week. And meanwhile, you see that the neural tube is already closed, and here you have the neural crest territories. The external surface is covered with ectoderm. Now, if we check above the umbilicus, uh, the territory a little bit earlier and a little bit later, then from the foregut, anteriorly the liver bud will grow out, posteriorly the pancreatic bud. Here the liver bud is already bigger, the pancreas is also growing. And you know that this will have to make a turn because it originally the liver grows anteriorly, but then it will move right, right? So that it moves right, this is again by the axis definition that the laterality is defined by the specific cascades of the uh, transcription factors. So this is in the liver and it will have to turn right later. Now let's summarize that what we know now about this endodermal tube uh, we know that we have a foregut, a midgut, and a hindgut, right? There are borders between them, which are not uh, visible borders on the inside lining, but they are visible territories uh, due to the blood supply, what you will learn in the next semester. Uh, both of them end with a closed territory, where the ectoderm and the endoderm uh, lays closely on each other. This is the bucopharyngeal membrane and the cloaca membrane. The bucopharyngeal membrane will rupture quite early, already on the uh, 21st day it starts to rupture, and the cloaca membrane will get ruptured at the end of the second month. Uh, if we make a little bit more detailed uh, drawing of this territory, then you see that here you will have the pharyngeal structures, pharyngeal arches, pouches, clefts. We will learn about those in detail in the next semester. Uh, so this is already here a part of the foregut. Right? This is the heart territory, I'm sorry. So this upper territory, this is here the pharyngeal gut. Uh, then it goes over to the esophagus. On the border between the two, then the trachea and the lungs will start to develop. Here you have the esophagus, the stomach, and two-thirds of the duodenum with uh, the liver and the gallbladder and with the pancreas, right? So these are the territories of the foregut. The midgut, right, which I'm always telling it has initially a wide connection with the York sac, but then in this wide connection, a loop will form, a, quite a long loop, because from the midgut, the entire small intestine plus uh, two-thirds of the, of the, of the uh, large intestine will also develop. And initially, this is this uh, loop of midgut. This is in a so-called physiological umbilical hernia, right? 
So it is protruded into the umbilical cord and it will pull back only at the beginning of the third month when the ventral body wall has already enough tissues due to the ventralization and it can close. So this is normal that there is a physiological umbilical hernia, but it must pull back to the body of the baby. And again, this is the same story like what you see here, that our body is a tube. Up to here, this, this is foregut. From here, that is midgut. There you have the hindgut. The entire inside, including the lung, the respiratory tract inside, is lined with endodermal tissues. Of course, in the wall of the gut and in the wall of the airways, you have also connective tissue and muscle elements. Those develop from the splanchnic mesoderm. On the external surface, there are the ectodermal structures, not only the stratified squamous keratinizing epithelium, but also the hair and its glands, what you learned in, in histology, plus the neural tube in the back. And in between, there are the structures which develop from the mesoderm, so bones, muscles, blood vessels, circulatory system, mostly develops from the, from the mesoderm, sometimes the ectomesenchyme, with the neural crest contributes. Okay, so what develops from the ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm? Here is the simple, a very simple way, uh, uh, as I describe it, is basically what I just explained. And don't forget that our body is a tube. And don't forget what we already listed previously, that what are the derivatives of the ectoderm, of the mesoderm, and of the endoderm. And at the end of the previous class, I also showed you a figure. Please try to understand it. If you understand these two figures, then it will solve a lot of problems that may occur in your future studies. Uh, one aspect is that where do the basic tissues originate from? I mean, from which major germ layer? Right? That's one aspect. The other aspect, that what basic tissues may be the derivatives of the specific germ layers. That's the other aspect. If you understand this clearly, and the basics for it is that our body is a tube, right? then, uh, then uh, your future studies will be easier and it will be much more logical that where do the specific organ parts come from. And now let's look at uh, these beautiful drawings of Max Brodel. So this is the initial stage at the end of the third week. At this stage, uh, the embryonic disc is about 1.7 millimeters. Imagine how small that is. And it just starts its flexion. We have already a small foregut and a small hindgut. And you see here that the heart is already turning to the ventral side. Here would be the bucopharyngeal membrane. And here in the back, you would have the cloaca membrane. Uh, this drawing corresponds about to this schematic figure, what I showed you previously. Here the placenta starts to develop. This is a, a little bit later on the fourth week, when we already have a well-defined foregut with the bucopharyngeal membrane and a well-defined hindgut here with the cloaca membrane. And you see that from the cloaca here, the allantois will protrude into the umbilical cord. Right? Here you see as it protrudes into the umbilical cord. It will be also initially, the allantois is also a part of the umbilical cord. But you also see here the blood vessels, which, are, which initially these blood vessels, they supply the allantois, but with the placental development, these blood vessels of the allantois will turn into the blood vessels of the placenta plus we have the York sac here. Now, from this picture, I will cut out this territory on the next picture here, right? So this is the same drawing. And here you see an embryo in the same developmental uh, phase. There you see the heart primordium here. Under it, there is the liver. The liver would be here. That's not very well shown here. And you see here the dorsal aorta. That's here also the dorsal aorta. You see here the brain vesicles. The brain vesicles would be in this white territory. And you see the structures here of the umbilical cord. Right? This is on the fourth week. In the middle of the fifth week, uh, then this umbilical hernia loop will start to form. Uh, with this, then the connection to the York sac that is getting narrower and narrower. So this connection this stalk which connects the York sac with the midgut, uh, that is called the Wittenlein duct. 
And uh, the Vitaline sac has also, the York sac has also a good blood supply, as you see here. This is a uh, returning sentence in your book that the York sac diminishes and it, it, it will disappear and so on, but it, take care, it doesn't disappear until about the third month of the development. And it must have important roles, although it's not yet clearly defined at what are those important roles. Uh, we just know it nowadays that the gynecologists, when they do the ultrasound examination, they look for the York sac, and if they don't see a healthy uh, sized uh, York sac, which may be up, uh, up to uh, six, eight millimeters in size, if they don't see it, then they must be suspicious that something is wrong with the baby and developmental malformations may form or even the baby uh, may die at this phase. So it's a very important structure initially. So here already we see this forming umbilical cord. You see that we have many structures and here I will list these structures. The ones which are here up, these are the important, most important ones and they are present until birth. What are these? Uh, there are two umbilical arteries because the Abdominal aorta, as you see it here, ends here practically in two big arteries. Plus here yet you have a tail artery because some animals will grow a tail. Of course, a tail needs also blood supply. In human, this tail artery will uh, diminish. But you also know from your anatomy studies that the abdominal aorta divides into the common iliac uh, branches and then we have the internal iliac branches and the external iliac branches. Internal iliac branches, they supply the lesser pelvis. On the fifth week, we don't have yet anything in the lesser pelvis. Uh, the external iliac uh, vessels, they supply the lower limb through the femoral artery. On the fifth week, we don't have yet lower limb, so they are not existing yet, the external iliac branches. What exists at this stage, only these two big end branches, the umbilical arteries. The umbilical arteries, initially, they served for the allantois, but with the, with the mammalian development, with the development of the placenta, they turn into the uh, to the umbilical arteries. So here you have the two umbilical arteries. They carry the blood to the placenta, where they, uh, it picks up the blood, picks up the, the oxygen and the nutrients, and it will be taken back by a single umbilical vein, vena umbilicalis. Uh, it's a single umbilical vein, though at the beginning there were two umbilical veins for a very short period. But at the end, we just end up with one umbilical vein. All these are embedded into the Wharton's jelly, which is a primitive connective tissue, which develops from the connecting stalk mesoderm and from the central extraembryonic mesoderm as the, with the flexion, uh, they fuse with each other. And on the surface, it is covered by the amnion, right? So on the surface, it's the amnion. What other structures do we have yet uh, during, during the development, which mostly disappear? We have the allantois, Right? We have the vital line duct, right? and we have the vital line vessels. For the vital line duct, we have an, uh, another term also like omphoroenteric or omphoromesenteric duct. You may find it, this also in the books. Unfortunately, we have some synonyms, but uh, nowadays the vital line duct is the most common name that is used. At the end of the fifth week, uh, the embryo is already 10 millimeters long. You see here the head process, these, these little bumps, these show you the brain vesicles. You see the pharyngeal arches here. You see the, uh, the lens placard. Uh, you see the heart and the liver primordium. It's, it's, uh, uh, of course, it's not uncovered. It's covered with the ectoderm on the surface, just it shows uh, through the ectoderm. And you see the limb buds here. You see the umbilical arteries. Here is the, uh, the allantois, and we have the physiological umbilical hernia, one umbilical vein, and there are the blood vessels connecting to the, uh, to the placenta, and there is also the blood supply for the York sac here. And again, I cut out this territory uh, from the picture. Here you have that. And there is a, a photo from the same phase of development. It's remarkably similar, though this photo was taken at least uh, 30, 40 years later, then uh, this drawing was made. Uh, the photos were taken, what I, all the photos that I showed, by Leonard Nilsson. He was a Swedish, he was a Swedish photographer, and he 
uh, he was a medical illustrator also with his photographies and he made these beautiful preparations. Of course, this did, they didn't make it like, the, like that, that day with an endoscope, they went into the uterus and took the pictures. These are aborted uh, uh, embryos, which he prepared and, and made a, a beautiful surrounding that you can really see everything. So the lighting and everything is very, very uh, professional that you can see all details. So what is what you can see here? You see the brain vesicles here. It's quite transparent in the rhombencephalon. This is here the lens placot. Here you see the pharyngeal arches. This is here the heart primordium, the liver primordium. And here you have the limb buds. These are the limb buds and that's here the umbilical cord. I put here these lines on it that you see where they are. But even if I make it disappear, they are visible that they are uh, there. So we are now at the end of the fifth week. And on the sixth week, the uh, entire body length of the, of the trunk of the baby, that's 23 millimeters about, we are on the sixth week. Uh, still, we have this physiolog physiological umbilical hernia. Right? You see now the three major structures inside the umbilical cord, the two arteries and the one vein. There would be the umbilical cord connecting to the placenta. But in this structure yet the uh, vital line duct is inside and along the vital line duct there is also a blood supply and the York sac must be also present. This is an ultrasound examination uh, from a six, uh, 10 week old fetus where you see the head and the trunk of the baby and here are the limb buds. We don't see the lower limb uh, territory from this aspect, but here is a well-defined York sac. The York sac at this stage must be about five, six millimeters and uh, it disappears completely by the 20th week, but it has a role. So please don't think that it has, doesn't have a role and it disappears earlier than this. In the third month, uh, the baby is already well developed. You see the eye territory. It's blackish brown because it has the pigmented epithelium of the eye. That's one layer of the retina that you saw in histology, this pigmented epithelium. It has well defined uh, limbs. Uh, you also see signs of ossification, like here you have the ribs already. Uh, right? We have the cartilaginous models, but they have already the ossification centers and it has the York sac in the third month. I used to say that the baby has a little ball to play with. On this series of pictures, I compared you from the internet. I collected some pictures of embryos of different creatures. So that's a row. This must be a duck probably, yeah, from, but from already from a later stage. For birds, that's typical that they have a very narrow neck and a very big head and huge eyes, right? This is a pig embryo and this is a cat embryo and they are remarkably similar like a human embryo. This is also a collection of these uh, different plantal stages in different animals and uh, the most interesting is this series when you see that fish, turtle, chicken, pig and human initially they are quite similar. Of course later they will be they will develop to absolute different creatures but the basics is the same. And this is the also cute story about an elephant in the National Geographic uh, uh, channel. So also on the YouTube, you can find a series that in the womb uh, from dif development of different animals. Uh, it's quite interesting to look at. It gives you a, also a hint that how human development uh, could run. And this shows you the uh, uh, development of a, an elephant uh, fetus in this, uh, that's 24 months long, the gestation of the elephant. And after 12 months, this is 45 centimeters and 13 kilograms. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>